Hi class and welcome to the first video on our new unit on cells, structure and function. So we're probably going to break this up into two separate videos. First we'll look at an overview of cells, how we view cells using microscopes, and then in the second video we'll look at how cells actually function. So remember we're just coming off of our great unit on the chemistry of life and learning all about those wonderful macromolecules. Well, when we think about ingesting macromolecules in our food, it's really our cells that are in fact taking in those macromolecules. And inside of every single one of your cells are all of these macromolecules doing their job. So let's take a look at how that happens with cells. So first, a basic definition, what are cells? Cells are the ultimate basic unit of life. The smallest thing considered to be alive is a cell. There can be organisms that are made up of one single cell. Now obviously we are not, we're composed of trillions of cells, but things like bacteria, for example, are composed of one single cell. Now they are part of an overall hierarchy of life, so I'm gonna, we're just gonna take a look at how humans are made up of various cells and levels of organization. So cells make up tissues, and so here's an example of a tissue of, I think this is a slide of a lung, okay? So a tissue, tissues make up organs, so this lung tissue makes up a lung, and then organs make up organ systems, so like the respiratory system with the trachea and the alveoli and the lungs, and then organ systems make up the entire human body. But remember, what's smaller than cells? Well, in fact, atoms are smaller than cells, macromolecules are smaller than cells, organelles, which we'll learn about in a second, which are inside of cells, are smaller. But cells are where life begins. There are two main types of cells. We call the first type a eukaryote and the second type a prokaryote. Now, our bodies are composed of eukaryotic cells, and they have things like a nucleus, they have membrane-bound organelles, they have a plasma membrane, they have ribosomes, and then prokaryotes are things like bacteria, and they lack some of the functions of eukaryotes. Now, I would love to tell you all about these, but I would rather you go ahead and do it. So for homework, I would like you to make a chart in your notes comparing prokaryotes and eukaryotes includes similarities and differences. Feel free to use the internet, use your book, whatever you'd like to make this chart in your notes, and we'll go over that in class. So just a little bit more information about prokaryotes. Like I said, prokaryotes are mostly bacteria. They don't have a true nucleus. Instead, they have this region called a nucleoid region. Um, they can sometimes have this pili or cilia. They have a flagella, which we'll talk about later in the video. Um, bacteria are everywhere. They're in your skin, they're in your intestines, they help humans function. They're used widely in biotechnology to create new medicines. They're used to make food. Um, prokaryotes, bacteria, they are everywhere. They get a bad rap, don't they? But in fact, they can definitely be our friend. Okay, now we've got two types of eukaryotic cells. The first type is an animal cell, and humans are composed of all different types of animal cells. And so one of the main differences about animal cells is that they do not have a cell wall, they don't have chloroplasts, they don't have um, a central vacuole, for, for instance. And the second type of a eukaryotic cell are plant cells. So they do have this thick cell wall, they have this central vacuole, they have chloroplasts, and again, I could go on about the differences and similarities of plant and animal cells, but I'd like you to do that. So make a chart in your notes comparing plant and animal cells, include similarities and differences. Again, use your book, use the internet, whatever you'd like, but that is a homework assignment. Just how big are cells? Well, to give you a little frame of reference, there are 50 to 75 trillion cells in your body. That is a lot of cells. Just in your heart, there are 2 billion cells alone. And I found this great little website that I'm going to take you to really quickly that really shows cell size and scale. All right, so what we're looking at here, this is a coffee bean. This is, say, just a piece of paper with some uh, text written on it. Now we can zoom in, okay, so there's a grain of rice, we can zoom in, there's a sesame seed, there's a tiny, tiny grain of salt, so you're getting a sense of how small we're getting. Okay, this is an organism called an amoeba. It is a unicellular protist, and a paramecium is another unicellular protist. Here is a human egg, okay, so females... When they reach puberty, they start releasing their eggs every month. This is how big that is, okay? And look how small the sperm is in comparison to that. 
This is a photoreceptor in your eye. This is a skin cell, okay? So a skin cell is even smaller than a human egg. And a red blood cell is even smaller. We get down into our chromosomes are even smaller. A bacteria is even smaller than that. A mitochondria, which is inside of your cells, is even smaller than that. And then finally, we get down to the smallest things, which are viruses. So the measles virus, the HIV. And let's see, what is the tiniest thing that we have here? Wow, we're even getting into tRNA and hemoglobin, which is a protein in your red blood cells, an antibody of your immune system. I just love this graphic. And now we're getting into a phospholipid, which we learned about in the first video, a water molecule, and then finally a tiny carbon atom, 340 picometers. Oh, I just love that graphic. I think that just gives you such a good frame of reference for how big cells are. So again, a skin cell is a little bit smaller than a human egg cell. Okay. <clears throat> If cells are so small, which I just proved to you, I hope that they are, how can we see them? Well, we have to use microscopes, and we're going to learn about two types of microscopes. The first type is called a light microscope, and this is what we're going to use in the lab. It can magnify up to a thousand times, and it can view living cells in motion. So it's a great tool for us to study living cells. The other type is called an electron microscope, and this is very expensive, a very nice microscope. We don't have one in the lab, but hopefully we'll be able to take a field trip sometime and see one. You can go up to 100,000 times magnification. However, the drawback for electron microscopes is that cells must be dead and specially prepared in order to view them. So here's an ant under a scanning electron microscope. Here's a poliovirus under a transmission electron microscope. Now there are two differences. There are differences between these microscopes. A scanning electron microscope only is looking at the surface of the structure. So we're just seeing the surface of the ant. A transmission is actually a cutaway and you can view internal structure. So picture maybe a big fruit and nut bread, a loaf of bread. If you cut away, you can see inside the bread and see all the raisins and the nuts in there. That's what a transmission electron microscope does. How do cells work? Well, every cell in your body has a specialized function, and so it's shaped a little bit differently and works a little bit differently. So I'm just going to give you a few examples. Your nerve cells have a very unique shape, and their shape, again, fits their function because their job is to get a signal and then transmit, transmit that signal down these long axons. You have muscle cells, and so these are three actually different types of muscle cells, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. And you can see that they're long and thin, they're banded, and that's so that they're flexible and so that they can be strong. You have skin cells, and lots of different types of skin cells, in fact. Uh, simple, simple cuboidal, uh, columnar, um, so these are what make up your outside skin and the lining of most of your intestines, for example. So these are all cells, okay? But they all have some things in common. They need some basic structures, and these basic structures are called organelles, which literally means little organs. And collectively, all of these organelles function to make energy for your cells, make proteins for your cells, move the cell, store, transmit genetic information, destroy or recycle dead or waste material, and finally, to communicate with other cells. So even though your body is made up of all these different types of cells, they do have these basic things in common. So let's start to take a look at these functions, and then we'll finish that in the second video. So first and arguably most important function is to store and transmit genetic, genetic information. Your cells are constantly making new cells to repair and replace old cells. And so they need to give that new daughter cell all of its DNA. And all of that DNA is stored in the nucleus. I like to think of it as the control center. So here's the nucleus, and I'm going to break apart all the different parts for you. First, we have the nuclear envelope. It's a double membrane, an outer membrane and an inner, inner membrane that encloses all of the genetic information. And it has these little pores. Now, I want you to think about and write down in your notes why. Why does this nucleus have these little pores? Think about a wiffle ball with all the big holes in it. That's what the nuclear envelope looks like. Okay, secondly, we've got the nucleolus sitting in the center. And this is what makes ribosomes. Okay, that's the only job of the nucleolus. It's a ribosome factory. It doesn't store DNA. It's not the master control center. It just makes ribosomes. And I'll explain what ribosomes are in a second. 
the main thing that's in the nucleus is your DNA, your chromatin. So here are two new vocabulary words. Chromatin is simply loosely coiled DNA. So it's just like if you've got a, whole, a, a ball of yarn or a ball of string, if that's what chromatin is. And then at some points in the cell cycle, it'll condense. It'll kind of squeeze together into the chromosome form, which you're familiar with, and that's tightly coiled DNA. So that's stored inside of the nucleus. On the nuclear envelope, we have ribosomes. Ribosomes are what make every single one of your proteins in your body. Now, ribosomes can either be bound to an organelle, like it's bound to the nuclear envelope, or it could just be free-floating in the cytoplasm. So remember, the nucleolus makes ribosomes, and the ribosomes make proteins. Fun fact about the nucleus is that your red blood cells actually do not have a nucleus, which is very fascinating, especially when you think in terms of a crime scene and what uh, detectives have to get from a crime scene. If they're just collecting blood in red blood cells alone, they're not going to have DNA in there to get the, the suspect. They're going to need to look at the white blood cells. So I just think that's very interesting. All right, let's do this last slide here. Making proteins. Arguably one of the biggest jobs of the cell is to make proteins because that's what makes you who you are. So let's take a look. What we're looking at here, this is the nucleus that we just learned about with the nuclear envelope and the nuclear pores. And then coming off of the nucleus, we have these two organelles, the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now here's a nice chart to copy down in your notes about the differences between these two types of endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth, as you can see, there's no little purple balls on it. There are no ribosomes, but the rough endoplasmic reticulum does have ribosomes. So that tells you a little bit about their function, right? The rough ER probably makes a lot of proteins, doesn't it? And the smooth ER does not. What the smooth ER does is it makes lipids. Lipids for especially membranes. Every single one of these organelles that we're going to look at is made up of a phospholipid membrane. Isn't that cool? Okay, rough ER is going to also make additional membrane for itself to repair itself. Smooth ER metabolizes carbohydrates and it detoxifies drugs, poisons. Anytime you take a medicine, it's going to go through the smooth ER. And then the rough ER makes proteins destined for secretion. And the next thing we'll look at starting the next video is the Golgi apparatus. So the rough ER is going to make all sorts of proteins, and then it's going to ship the proteins to the Golgi apparatus for the Golgi to do its job. And so we'll take a look at that in the next video.